informed the societal messages about masculinity, which are at the core of just about every social problem we have in this very kind of country. The single greatest crisis in America today is the crisis of masculinity. How does a boy know when he can become a man? What's the value, what's the characteristic that defines some kind of authentic masculinity? Boy, you have this unparalleled platform, power, and position to help guide and nurture boys in the manhood and masculinity. So let me show you what the socialization process looks like. By the time every boy's five or six, they've been given this mandate to be a man. Then they all get three fundamental lies about what it means to be a man. They come from the culture, movies, media, magazines, 24-7. They're the same lies that were fed to me when I was a boy that are fed to your players today. And the first one is this. Every boy learns this by the time they're eight or nine years old. They learn this on the ball field and the playground and during practices all over your community and country. And that is in the culture. We teach young boys that what it means be a man has something to do with athletic ability. Somehow we associate it with size or strength or some kind of skill set that allows boys to compete on that playground and win. So what happens in America and on your field, that boy that can walk on that playground and catch it down an hour and hit the head of the that boy is elevated in this culture. He's seen it having more value, more worth. That boy is described a little more masculine. And I would say this. That boy is set up for a tremendous failure and frustration in life. Because being a man doesn't have a single thing to do with athletic ability, size, or strength. Think about all the boys that come onto your field. They don't just have interest in sports. They want to do music and drama and debate and all kinds of things. But in this culture, most of those boys are pushed, pushed against the periphery of the playground and impregnated with this idea that they don't have what it takes a man, which is going to manifest throughout the world. Second lie is this, and every boy in America learns this by the time they're in junior high school, and that is in the culture we associate masculinity with issues of sexual conduct. What does it mean to be a man? It means you have the capacity to bring some young girl alongside of yourself and then use her. Use her to either validate some kind of masculine insecurity or use her to gratify some kind of physical need. That certainly doesn't make you a man. That makes you a user of other human beings. Later on, you get the third lie in this culture. And that is we associate masculinity with economic success. As though you can measure what a man is based on his job type, his position, his power, or the amount of possession someone has given. So here's the problem. We got all these lies. And I would challenge you to watch any commercial tied to the next NFL game you watch. And you look at the commercials and you'll see all three of these live moving in. The fundamental goal of advertising is to create insecurity and doubt about our own masculinity. And then we're taught is to just purchase this or drive that or have this or get the right kind of girl. Somehow that will validate who and what we are. So you got all these boys, no definition of masculinity. Many of them have never seen it modeled, they haven't been nurtured, they haven't been trained. We've got a crisis of boys growing up, a parson dad, and who becomes the masculine role model in America today? It's the professional athlete. Why? Not because young people are evaluating their character, how they're leveraging their platform and position for the benefit of their families or their community, but because they manifest it. They have athletic ability to compete against other men and women. They have opportunities for sexual conquest and economic success. Or there's a crisis in this country. And you take those three lives, and I don't care whether the issue is boys with guns or girls with babies or immorality or boardrooms or the beat down women take in America, it comes back to these three lives. Fundamentally, the purpose of every coach ought to be to help boys become men in the midst of that. So you've got that socialization, the social mandate, that then produces a thing called Alexa Fine. That's a mental health designation. It's a Latin. Al means without, much means words, and thine means emotions and feelings. It's an inability to put your emotions and feelings into words. The American Psychological Association would say 80% of American men suffer from some form of a lot of time. An inability to express your feelings and your thoughts. 
Where does it come from? It comes from the fact that when we were five and six, we were told to be a man and disconnect your heart from your head. And here's where the crisis begins. Because if you don't understand your own feeling, you don't stand understand your own emotions, you'll never be able to understand the feelings and emotions of another human being. Boy, you want to figure out how does it feel like to be coached by you? You have to be in touch with your own feelings, your own emotions to understand the impact your words and, and uh, action are having on the life of young people. That then uh, creates a masculine depression in this country, and all you see are the three footprints. The tremendous number of men that live isolated and alone without deep, meaningful relations. We have a lot of pals that we do activities with, but very few men that we share face to face deepest struggles, doubts, and insecurities that we have. Second thing is substance abuse. I don't think there's anything more painful than feeling in life that you don't quite measure up as a man. So what men do is they start to medicate the pain of it. Alcohol, drugs, sex, materialism, pornography, whatever you need to attach to in order to feel more masculine and insecure. And I'd say this, if someone that does this work, or there is a crisis in this country, around the issue of pornography. The average age of a first-time viewer is an 11-year-old boy. And when I was a boy, I would have walked three miles to see a Playboy back then. Today, this stuff is chasing kids down with a brutality and a bestiality that needs to be addressed. There might not be a better group of people in America to address these issues than you as coaches. And the third footprint of that massive depression is violence. Well, we're the most violent nation in the world. We're 4% of the world's population, and yet 25% of all incarcerated people in the world are invisible. So here's the question. If part of your purpose is to help boys become men, then how do you develop a coaching philosophy? How do you take the power of the whistle and break that cycle? How do you, how could you, how should you break the socialization through your own platform as a coach. So, you know, there's a tremendous issue. The nurturing part of this is the woundedness of young boys and girls in this country with absent men. We have a tremendous number of dads that have just abdicated the role and responsibility. You've got a whole other group of dads in America that I, I call them uh, lone ranger dads. They kind of have a presence in the life of their children, but they never deposit anything in them. They give their kids this kind of message. They might come to the game, but they leave their children wondering what they ever thought of. I call them Lone Ranger Dad because when I do their funerals, all the children stand around the castle and they ask, who was that master? Never knowing how their dads felt about them, or how they thought about them, how they connected to them. So you have this problem with it. When you talk about triggers, coaches blowing up on the side, Boy, it's a result of unresolved issues in our own life. You're standing in that field, you feel like you're standing there butt naked. Boy, everybody that stands behind you is evaluating you based on your nature. You have this tendency to evaluate yourself based on the performance of, uh, of your play. Some kid uh, blows a coverage, uh, uh, a touchdown gets scored, and you get triggered. Something cognition pops up in your mind. I'm not good enough. They're making me look stupid. I don't feel good about myself. And out of all of this anger and rage, screaming, swearing, shouting at some kid because they made you feel bad. That didn't have anything to do with that kid. Boy, as an adult coach, I don't care what happened to you as a child, you have a responsibility to bring healing and wholeness to yourself so that you can help boys become you want to be a better coach, you've got to be a better kid. And when you coach in the right way, it will permeate aspects of your life. Think about the influence you have in the life of young people. Can you see that?
children do make your influence possible. What we've got is all these young people that are acting out and reenacting the values they see in coaching and in, uh, in adults. Or you as a coach, you might think to yourself as a youth coach, I'm not Patrick Gerald, I'm not Robert Smith. The reality is you have way more power and influence over young people than either one of them ever will have. U.S. Uh, State's anti-doping agency just did a massive study. And the conclusion was the younger you go, the greater influence coaches have and they're wiser to play. Boy, but you gotta make sure that you're living your own integrity kind of life. You're in control of your own uh, behavior on the side. So everything is developed by your purpose. You've got to have a purpose thing. Any parent comes to me, you want to alleviate the parent problem? They come to me and tell me about your program, I tell them what to tell you about. I'm going to help your son become a man uh, uh, of empathy and integrity who will be responsible and change the world for good. So that's my purpose statement. Now, let me just define masculinity for you. Let me give you my definition of what it means to be a man. And it happens to be the same definition as feminine, because it's really about our common humanity. Now, when I was in my seventh year of professional football, uh, my youngest brother, 10 years younger, grew up in a home in Buffalo. My mother and grandmother raised four children. My brother just graduated from high school, getting ready to go to college, a big recruit. I got him in training camp with the Colts. I wanted him to learn the work ethic of a professional athlete, the skills and techniques of a defensive lineman. The very first week of training camp, I'm sitting on a taping table getting my ankles taped for an afternoon practice. When my brother walked up to me with his massive black and blue mark on his chest. The trainer saw that, sent him to the doctors for a blood test. That night I got a call from John Hopkins Hospital. Bring your brother there right away. Upon admitting him into the hospital, the doctor pulled me aside and said, Listen, Billy's got cancer, it's a type of cancer where there's virtually nothing we can do for him. And I remember being absolutely devastated. Devastated, one, by the thought of losing the person that I probably loved the most in this entire world. And I think I was equally devastated by the reality that everything I had invested my life in, my whole concept about who and what I was as a man, was all uh, dictated to by my athletic ability, sexual conquest, and economic success. And when my 18-year-old brother was lying in his deathbed, Tears in his eyes and his face his own mortality. All I had was this locker room speech. My heart was disconnected from my head. So I had a cock for the next to the bed. And I literally spent every night of the NFL season, except for a away game, on that cock. I'd get up in the morning, eat breakfast with him, go to practice, come back, have dinner, and try to help him make it through the night. Five months I spent on a pediatric oncology Five months in a waiting room with all these other families that had children facing life threatening illnesses. And if you ever want to know where truth in America resides, where perspective and authentic community is, it's in those waiting rooms. Because in that waiting room, you suddenly realize it's not just about my child on that floor, it's about all of our children. You had this tremendous perspective. Uh, but then you saw maybe for the first time what really was important in life in all the secondary issues. You had this incredible community. When good news walked in that way, some child's white self count went up 10 points, everybody celebrated that. And when death and devastating news walked in, everybody tried to anticipate that. Five months I spent there, and then just before the last game of the season, I made a decision to bring my brother home so that he could die in the presence of the people that had loved and nurtured him. And I'll never forget wheeling him out of his hospital court, put him in my car, and I 